She said, this is the first one of the year. I said, yes, it is. How awesome is that to have students excited to come out and think together, talk together um, about what it means to be a, a citizen of this, um, this beautiful state that we live in um, and the world that we live in here as well. So um, my name is Melissa Baker Busamra. I am the Associate Director of Student Life um, for Civic Engagement. I work over in the Kirkhoff Center and the Community Service Learning Center. Um, I'm here tonight to just do a quick intro to the Community Service Learning Center um, and to welcome all of you to our Democracy 101 series. So I'm just going to make a couple of brief uh, announcements Announcements, and then I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague Kate Remlinger, uh, who's here on behalf of the Making Waves Initiative. So for those of you who don't know the Community Service Learning Center, uh, we would invite you to come on over. Um, we're located in 1110 Kirkhoff Center. Um, we are a place for students um, who care about the world that we live in. Um, we're a place where students can come to find ways to give back to the community, to get involved in the community, um, to use your voices uh, in the community and make decisions, help to make decisions about the, the world that we live in. So we have lots of opportunities um, around community engagement and volunteerism. Um, we do have a really exciting beach cleanup coming up. Um, actually, that's full for registration, but we will take walk-ins. That's this Saturday. Um, as a part of the Making Waves initiative. We also have Make a Difference Day coming up. Um, so if you're interested, we do have some materials. This is a great opportunity to learn more about the um, community that we live in, uh, particularly the, the Grand Rapids area, and to give back, um, get involved in some local nonprofits and community organizations there. Um, so please consider uh, coming out and, and giving back and getting to know your community through Make a Difference Day. Um, we also have materials out on the table um, where we where you came in um, that kind of just outline the the rest of the Democracy 101 series. So feel free to grab that. We've got some really great topics um, coming up this semester. I want to give a quick shout out to Jane Johnston. Jane, give us a wave. Jane Johnston is uh, one of our student employees in the Community Service Learning Center. She's also a Democracy Fellow, um, and she has really taking leadership with our series this year. So we appreciate your work on pulling all this together, Jane. Um, the last nod I want to give is to our Brooks College uh, mentors. There we have one of our mentors. So if you're here for either Lib 100 or Lib 201, Maddie is here and available to help connect what you're learning tonight, what we're talking about tonight, to your coursework in Lib 100 or 201. Uh, I think that's all for my announcements. I just want to say we are really happy to have all of you here. We're incredibly happy to have our distinguished guests here with us tonight to talk about a really important issue. Um, and we would welcome you back to upcoming Democracy 101 events. They'll be taking place weekly uh, at 6 p.m. and at noon. So you'll have to take a look at our schedule um, to learn more. Okay, and thank you very much to Kate and the Making Waves Initiative for co-sponsoring tonight's session. We're really excited to partner. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Hi, have you heard about the Making Waves Initiative? This big splash week, this is our kickoff week. Maybe you went kayaking yesterday. Anybody go kayaking? No, well, bummer, you missed it. It was beautiful. Uh, we even got the president and provost in a double kayak. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the initiative. Um, and you can find pamphlets out in the table there. There's also a raffle there. We're raffling off gifts next week, so please fill that out. The initiative has four main goals, and it's a two-year project at Grand Valley. One is to foster interdisciplinary collaboration and to think about water outside the box of what you might think of the physical properties of water, but think about water, how it's represented in literature. How is re um, water represented in dance and music and the arts? So really taking a across the campus view of water. Another goal is to help foster a bigger mm, footprint or water footprint, I could say, of Grand Valley. Water is such a big part of who we are. We're on the Grand River. We're near Lake Michigan. We have the Annis Water uh, Research Institute. So water is part of our local as well as um, institutional identity. A third goal is to create resources and activities for faculty, staff, and students. Like co-sponsoring this event, like the other events we've had this week, we had uh, the chief director, director of the Mackinac Bridge speak with us on Monday. 
tomorrow night, Peter Annan, he's a journalist. He wrote a book called The Great Lakes Water Wars. Or Yes, I think that's the, sorry if I messed up the title. It's something like that. It's about how states and countries want the water out of the Great Lakes. Following that is going to be a concert under the big tent you might see by the pond right now uh, by the Crane Wives. And maybe you've heard of that local regional band. Um, Friday is Distractions at the Divide. If you don't know what the Divide is, it's this geographical line of the campus. There's going to be a dunk tank where you can dunk some of your professors and administrators and fellow students. Um, one of them is in this room. And um, <laughs> we're going to have a 51-foot water slide. It's a day to have fun with water. Um, go to our website, gvsu.edu slash making waves. You can sign up for our Water Olympics in teams of two to four, and they're going to be great prizes and lots of honor. The last um, goal that we have for the initiative is to empower you as students um, to make waves through advocacy and community engagement. And participating in DEM 101, Democracy 101, is one way that you can do that and learn some of those skills. So thank you very much. Um, I'm thrilled to see a full house here. Thanks, Kate. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, our moderator for this evening. Uh, Adrian Wallace comes to us from the School of Communications. Um, Adrian is going to guide us in a conversation tonight about the topic of PFAS contamination in Michigan. So how many of you are familiar with PFAS? At least the acronym, right? Um, how many of you had heard this acronym a year ago or two years ago? Fewer of you. Um, how many of you really know what that means and what the implications of PFAS are in our regional water system? Yeah, so we've got a lot of learning to do tonight. I'm really excited to welcome our panelists who can help us understand the topic and also understand um, what our, our legislators are doing um, in the face of, of our, uh, the issue of PFAS. So Adrian, thank you very much. It's always nice to be in a room full of students and teachers that aren't required to be here. So thank you for that. It's awesome to see everybody here. So um, my role tonight here is to um, involve you in this conversation as much as possible. So um, I'm sure that our two guests are pretty, f like you're familiar with interruptions, I'm guessing, in your daily jobs. So um, please, if you have a question at any time um, during this, um, please put your hand up. We'll come around to where you are. Um, We'd like to make this as much of a dialogue as possible as opposed to a lecture because I know you probably don't want to sit through a couple of hours of that. So um, that's sort of my role in that is to make us a little bit more back and forth. So I do want to introduce our guests really quickly here. Um, Dr. Rick Roditsky um, is a professor of water resources at the Annis Water uh, Resources Institute at Grand Valley, uh, conducts research on the fate and transport of toxic chemicals in the environment. It's a very, very light topic there, Rick. <laughs> Um, and previously, he was the Vice President of Environmental Services for a large consulting engineering firm called EarthTech, involved in the remediation of hazardous waste sites. Um, he has a PhD in Environmental Health Sciences and Toxicology and a Master's in Water Resources Science from U of M. Um, he's been concerned with this issue for quite a while now, and we'll get some background on that in just a moment. Um, but he's been doing research upon this issue, uh, meeting with local and state um, officials in order to make change and in general just monitoring the state of affairs in this area for, for a while now, and we'll hear a lot about that background. And then um, we have Senator Winnie Brinks, um, who represents the 29th District of Michigan, previously served as a state rep in the same district. Thank you, that's mine, that's my district. Um, she serves in the um, uh, Energy and Technology Committee as well as the Committee on Environmental Quality. During her time in the Senate, um, she's introduced legislation that would limit the amount um, of this chemical in drinking water and advocated extensively for water quality in Michigan. So we'll start out with something really light, Dr. Rudisky. Um, <laughs> can you please talk to us a little bit about your research in general um, and you know, maybe the extent of it through time even that you've been focused on this? Uh, just on, on PFAS or yes, just, please. okay. Um, I uh, started uh, in 2013 when a uh, citizens group contacted me about uh, concerns about the demolition of the Wolverine Tannery. And in doing some background studies on that, I found out that they uh, made hush puppy shoes. And I remember my parents bought me hush, pu hush puppy shoes because I was always getting my shoes wet and these were waterproof. And they were really uh, a miracle product because they were actually very, very waterproof. 
And the waterproofing compound that was used was something called Scotchgard. And I've been uh, teaching classes in water resources and environmental chemistry, and we've always talked about the banning of Scotchgard as one of the um, one of the major events around 2000, and this was a product that everybody was using. I mean, we had Stainmaster carpet in our house, and I was waterproofing my hiking boots and Gore-Tex and all that. And to find out that that was hazardous um, was a big surprise to everybody. And uh, I think it was 2002 that they actually uh, banned Scotchgard. And we were concerned about Scotchgard and chromium and some other compounds that were associated with the tannery. So um, ever since 2013, I've been trying to read everything I could about uh, PFAS, um, understanding the toxicology, and then um, actually doing some studies of uh, PFAS in uh, Muskegon County. We received a small grant from the uh, Community Foundation in Muskegon County to look at some of the tributaries and lakes, uh, the concentrations of PFAS. So can you tell us the difference between <laughs> PFAS, PFOS, PFOA, please? Yes. Um, PFAS, PFAS is a uh, group of 4,000 plus compounds. So it's a really large uh, group of chemical compounds. And these have all made their way into our water, into our food system, and into our air without extensive testing. So um, these compounds are all of concern. And the P stands for per and poly. So per and poly means that every molecule in PFAS has a fluorine attached to it. So fluorine is a very electronegative compound. A very, uh, it takes a lot of energy to make PFAS, and the biological systems and the natural degradation mechanisms in the environment do not have the energy to break that bond. So it's actually the fourth strongest bond in nature. So um, these materials last forever, and that's one of the major uh, problems. So PFAS refers to all of those 4,000 plus compounds. PFOS, F-O-S, is Scotchgard. And then PFOA, P-F-O-A, is the material that's used in Teflon. So um, and there's, like I said, 4,000 plus, and the PFBS, I mean, it's, it's really hard to keep track of all the different compounds. So in a nutshell, why are these chemicals so terrible for humans? Well, I think they're uh, particularly a challenge because, number one, there's so many of them. Uh, number two, they're water-soluble, so they spread. Most contaminants that uh, I've dealt with, like lead and oils and things like that. They don't spread the way that uh, PFOS compounds do, so they travel great distances. And what caused 3M to ban them back in 2000 was they were found out that they were building up in people's blood. So we all have these compounds uh, in our bloodstream. The levels have went down over the years, but they uh, attach to a major protein in our body and circulate in our blood. So most contaminants like mercury sticks to your muscles and um, DDT goes into your fatty tissue, but these actually circulate in our bloodstream. So um, anytime you have a compound that doesn't go away, that uh, spreads great distances and then circulates in your blood, that's, those are <laughs> three really you know, good reasons why they shouldn't be around. And then uh, throughout the years they've been studied and they've been associated with uh, a whole variety of health effects, um, testicular and uh, kidney cancer, uh, hypertension, uh, cholest high cholesterol, uh, developmental effects, and immunology-related effects. So you have suppressed uh, immune systems, uh, fertility, um, and we're just kind of scratching the surface. They uh, seem to mimic hormones and stick to uh, important biomolecules. So that's uh, why we're concerned about them. I'm just going to keep grilling you on this, I guess. This <laughs> okay. is how it's going to go in the beginning. But um, could you talk to us a little bit about um, the recent the water catastrophes that have been happening um, north of here and, and throughout the rivers? A little well, bit on that. Sure. We uh, have a, uh, an ongoing uh, catastrophe in terms of uh, groundwater pollution in the Rockford area. And 
the tannery had to dispose of its waste. Uh, the, the tanning process is very inefficient and in, it generates 800 uh, grams of waste for every kilogram of leather, leather that it processes, so that waste had to be disposed of. And it was disposed of in two areas, uh, in the Rockford um, Plainfield Township area. And both of those had a number of houses built around them, and they didn't know that there was a hazardous waste disposal site in that area. So there's 1,000 wells that are contaminated. These are uh, private residential wells, and it's the largest groundwater contamination site, I think, in the history of Michigan. Uh, so there's 1,000 uh, people that have uh, contaminated water. And then because the tannery uh, is located on the Rogue River, uh, there's actually a lot of groundwater pollution at the tannery, a lot of uh, soil pollution at the tannery. And there's uh, 40 uh, kilometers of, uh, of, river that, of uh, the Rogue River that are contaminated, and there's a fishing advisory against consumption of fish because uh, the fish bioaccumulate this material. And then there's also foam contact advisories. So uh, PFAS is an anti-foaming agent, but it does stick to the natural foam in the water, and the foam's uh, thousands of parts per trillion, so uh, there's an advisory for contacting the foam. So we have uh, 25 square miles of groundwater contamination, um, 40 kilometers of, of river contamination, and that's all in the Rockford uh, area, so it's a really significant issue. We have some of the highest blood levels, too, in the people that, are, uh, that live around the, the landfills. So it's a health issue, too. So, um, Senator Brinks, um, perhaps you could also weigh in on this a little bit and talk to us a little bit about how all of this came to the attention of authorities and what type of activities are happening right now to um, remedy this situation. Um, even locally, it's fine. Yeah, uh, as Rick mentioned, uh, there were some really active citizens who started kind of digging into documents and paperwork and um, questioning some of the answers they were getting from their local leaders as well as local uh, uh, folks over in charge of uh, the tannery site um, from uh, the company, uh, Wolverine, that had been uh, in charge of that site or that owns that site. Um, and so they really actually did a lot of great really just kind of grassroots citizen research to kind of get us started asking the right questions. And, um, you know, they they probably, um, I know they talked with media early on with reporters who were doing investigative reporting on uh, environmental issues, and uh, they also talked with Rick. Um, but e there was certainly some knowledge brewing about that at a local level and in those kinds of circles, and certainly in academic circles, um, a couple of years before it started really coming out in the news. And in, I believe it was 2017, there was a whole series of articles in uh, MLive that really kind of popped the lid off of this and helped uh, really grow an awareness of uh, what was exactly happening or had happened and putting all the pieces together about where waste was disposed of, why it was a problem, uh, what we knew about where things got hauled and how it was disposed of. Um, and so uh, that started coming out in the news. Of course, when that happens, there are all kinds of people who call their lawmakers and say, have you heard about this? You guys need to look into this. Something needs to be done. And so um, Rockford and Plainfield Township were not in my district. Uh, my district is, uh, well now the Senate district is bigger, but at the time it was a house district which was half the city of Grand Rapids and our water was um, uh, apparently not impacted at that point. Um, and so I, initially said, yeah, that's not my district, and I would refer them to their folks, but I kept getting phone calls. And finally I said, okay, I'll take a meeting and uh, we'll, we'll kind of figure out what's going on here. And uh, really the more I learned, the more uh, concerned I became. And um, as you all know, people move and so does water. And so as I learned more and more about this chemical, I realized this is a lot bigger than just a couple of spots on a map in northern Kent County. I learned it was uh, potentially a problem throughout our state and indeed our nation. Um, I started hearing from folks up in Oscoda who live near a military base and um, nearly every military base in the nation 
uh, has some of this contamination around it, uh, to the best of our knowledge. It's some of the worst contamination spots are adjacent to and on these military bases. So I started realizing that this is really not just a, a local issue or a state issue, it's a national issue. And even if you look at it uh, worldwide, there are scientists struggling to address this and figure out what the best response is. And um, governments at all levels are having to deal with this from a public health perspective, uh, but also from an environmental contamination perspective, uh, because this certainly uh, has impacts for human health that are very concerning. Uh, and the more we know, uh, the more concerning it gets. Um, but it also impacts our entire ecosystem and all of the food chains uh, that are part of that. So um, even talking with environmental organizations whose business it is to know what's going on with our environment and what should be happening in terms of uh, public policy recommendations, there was very little uh, real practical knowledge uh, from uh, folks who were pretty informed about a lot of other things. And so uh, we really dug in. I think, I can't remember exactly when I called uh, Rick, but uh, realized he, we had, you know, a f uh, one of our uh, most knowledgeable uh, voices on the topic was right here in my backyard. So um, a lot of uh, reading everything I could about, uh, I'm sure that we were reading slightly different articles as he's uh, deep in the science, um, but um, the more I understood, uh, the more concerned I became. So at uh, some point, I um, was trying to get the attention of my fellow lawmakers on this, and it was a real struggle. Um, there were people throughout the state who were talking with lawmakers, and they were not getting any traction. Uh, so when they heard I was interested, again, they uh, started calling me. So I started getting phone calls from Moscota and from all kinds of places. So um, at that point, I thought, well, somebody needs to lead on this. So I, I uh, proposed a bill that would establish maximum contaminant limits in drinking water simply to start a conversation, draw a line in the sand, and say, this is my best guess from re reading what I've read, but we need more science on this. We need more advice on uh, what this means in terms of health impacts. And I know that we need to do something as a state uh, government, uh, certainly in the absence of federal regulation because the uh, EPA is really dragging its feet on this. Um, and maybe they do that with everything, but uh, I certainly don't have the confidence that they will do what needs to be done in a timely manner to protect human health or that of our uh, ecosystem and our, our wildlife. So uh, because that's important to us as a state, I um, introduced a bill and that really kind of got the ball rolling in Lansing, talking about a conversation about dedicating resources to the problem, to understanding the depth of the problem. Um, and we can talk more about that if you'd like, but um, we've got a lot of good conversations started, uh, but still a lot to be done. Dr. Radisky, since you um, testified with, um, or for, I guess, Senator um, Gary Peters, how, how far have we come since then? Well, I think the, uh, as far as uh, the federal government really hasn't done very much. Um, again, um, they move slower, but uh, as a state government, the, the state government um, formed what's called MPART, which is the Michigan uh, PFAS Task Force. And they've sampled 1,700 water supplies throughout the state. So we've got a handle on what people are drinking. These are um, municipal water supplies, but also daycare centers and schools. So uh, there's a lot of data that we're collecting. And I think one of the biggest, uh, um, I guess, Im important uh, as, as far as what's, uh, what's happening one of the most important aspects is that we're looking at uh, passing our own MCLs in Michigan, and they're considerably lower than the federal MCL. The federal, uh, it's not even an MCL, but the federal guideline, I don't want to, <laughs> yeah, it's an advisory, so it's, it's 70 parts per trillion. And if you look at uh, the same two compounds in Michigan, we're looking at uh, nine or eight and 16. So. Uh, we're looking at 24 total instead of 70 uh, for PFAS and PFOA, plus we've got standards for uh, five other compounds. So Michigan is taking a lead on this, and uh, I've, uh, I sign up for a Google search. Uh, you know, one of the questions about how to learn about this, um, I, 
I get a, a Google search every morning of all the news for PFAS, and then I get a Google, a Google Scholar search for all the research. And that's my morning reading over coffee. <laughs> so that doesn't sound very exciting, but uh, in order for me to keep up with uh, what's happening on a regulation level, I have to look at the news, and in order for me to keep up on the science level, I have to look, up, look at the science. But uh, I think having uh, the state organization plus uh, going after the MCLs, Michigan is uh, moving in the right direction. If I can just add, we, we really are leading on that as a state. There's only, I think, maybe two other states who have MCLs established in statute or in rules. Uh, there are several other states taking a look at it, um, but we're really on the front of that uh, wave, so to speak, and I think we'll see it um, coming to other states soon. Uh, and we have um, this impart uh, group was set up under Governor Snyder as a temporary body that answered to him to help deal with this crisis. And it was the last year of his administration. So um, that was still there when uh, the new administration took over at the beginning of this year. Um, but Governor Whitmer uh, recognized the good work that had been started. She made it a permanent body um, and uh, created more cooperation and um, interdepartment mental staff that uh, are uh, in charge of dealing with the various issues. So there's health issues, of course, there's DNR issues, there's um, uh, eagle issues or called DEQ. So uh, that structure being in place is some of the most um, organized that any level of government has gotten in terms of being really intentional about um, addressing the issue. So uh, we, we are starting to make progress and people are starting to listen and recognize that this is a problem worth um, some resources, time, effort, and um, a lot of really smart people are taking a look at it. Uh, and we do have an expedited process for coming up with those uh, MCLs in water, ma maximum contaminant limits. So um, we are not only paying attention to this in the normal, through the normal routes, we're taking extraordinary measures to make sure that we are doing the best we can to address it as soon as possible. So, you have a question in the back there. oh great, sorry, you caught me sleeping up here. Hold on a second, let me come to you with a microphone. I was just gonna ask, um, how's it not spreading up the river more? Is it just staying in that section that's restricted or? Well, um, it moves with the flow of the water. So uh, there are studies of the Grand River now. So people are tracking it from the Rogue River to the Grand River. So it, it is probably spreading, but it's getting diluted at the same time. But dilution is not the solution, so that's. That should go on a bumper yeah. sticker, I feel like. <laughs> okay, so what is the resistance? It sounds pretty bad. What's why isn't it more of a priority or faster? What, what's going on here? Um, the, the, it, it falls under the term wicked problems, and that's something that we like to discuss at the university. But um, it's really something that's extremely pervasive in our lives, and it's in our food packaging. We get between 60 to 70 percent of our PFAS exposure from our food packaging. So it's not just water, we're focusing on one little bit of it. But uh, there's so many compounds, we don't have analytical methods to test for all of them. And there's there, um, one of the classic reports that just came out maybe about six months ago was that it was in dental floss. And I use dental floss ribbon because my teeth are close together and if I use the <laughs> The dental floss, the standard dental floss, it breaks all the time, and people that use the ribbon have higher levels of PFAS in their blood than people that you know use the standard dental floss. So um, it's just everywhere, and we don't uh, necessarily have um, the toxicology studies are just being done right now. So um, it's it's a very large problem, and the other thing that was just in the news was the DoD is starting to get a grip on how significant this is, and um, it, it's going to be a major issue just to clean up and provide water for the military, because all the military bases, the water supplies on the bases are contaminated. So, and that's not fixing the water that's contaminated for residential wells and lakes. So, it's just a very large problem, and we have to come to grips with it. I would add that um, 
because it is such a large problem with so many implications or potential implications, there is some sense that uh, among some people, especially uh, uh, I would say public policymakers, legislators, and even folks in departments, once you start asking these questions and turning over these stones, and once you know uh, the extent of the problem, are obligated to protect our constituents from uh, any unnecessary exposures, right? So uh, that's really not a very good word, necessary or unnecessary exposures, but from any uh, exposure that we can. And so once we understand how pervasive it is, I mean, if you, if you think, the things that keep me up at night, and probably uh, Rick too, in in some cases, and many other lawmakers, is you know what are the implications for this when it comes to things like agriculture? Uh, what are the implications when it comes to things like tourism, uh, fishing, and hunting? Right? There's one place uh, um, I can't remember the name of the marsh, marsh. Clark's Marsh, where uh, the deer tissue uh, has the muscle has tested. Uh, so high for this that you should not ever think of eating that deer from uh, that was lived within a certain range of distance from that marsh. Uh, many, many rivers throughout the state are uh, have signage now for do not eat the fish. Uh, so there are implications that have massive economic impacts, uh, and we only know a little bit about uh, the potential health impacts. So once we start opening up all of those uh, cans of worms and understanding it, um, there will be consequences for all of us, whether we act or don't act. And there are some people who just don't want to have this problem right now. Uh, people who would prefer to talk about funding schools or funding roads or doing other things that they ran for office to do, you know, criminal justice reform, all good things, right? Um, so. It's something that is, uh, as you, you, he called it a wicked problem, but uh, it's, it's one of those things that we have to deal with and it's not fun to deal with. And it takes resources out of the other things that we'd really like to be able to focus on as policymakers and leaders. Um, so sometimes there's some hesitancy there. There's also just an element of disbelief among uh, some folks who haven't read very much and who don't understand the science. And when you talk about this being one drop of water, like a part, per, uh, I don't know, 70 parts per trillion is one drop of water in a uh, an Olympic-sized swimming pool, or more or less. I may be off by uh, multitudes there, but it's either way, you get the idea. It's super, super tiny. Um, I had a legislator, a, a colleague of mine, say to me, this stuff is so small, it doesn't matter. I said, it's so small that even tiny, tiny amounts really, really matter if they're in your body for the next 60 years. So um, it's interesting to hear how uh, people are trying to make sense of the scope of the problem and our ability to address it. So sometimes that causes roadblocks. And I think as humans, uh, we have to look realistically at what we can do and what we should do first. Uh, and in, in my mind, as we knew, uh, drinking water was one of the, the main pathways for that to enter uh, human beings and impact health. Uh, that was my first line of defense to say, this is something we know how to control. We've got pretty good science about how to get it out of drinking water. Uh, and it's a manageable task that we can start with. And so that's what, uh, that's what led me to put that on the table first. Uh, but there's a whole lot of other things and implications for public policy, for law, for environmental rules that really do need to be addressed as well. So would you mind talking a little bit about the um, partisan or nonpartisan work that's being done um, either from a community standpoint or even from a policy model um, to address this issue? in regard to corporations and also the community? Yeah, so um, there certainly is bipartisan interest in uh, taking a look at this and doing certain things to address the issues of uh, contamination. Uh, there's varying degrees of willingness to hold corporations accountable for things um, that corporations are trying to tell us they had no knowledge of how bad it was. Um, and there's a point in time that they didn't realize how damaging some of the chemicals they were using were. Um, but there's also a point in time much, much earlier than I knew about it than Rick knew about it, uh, than even a manufacturer using it uh, knew about it, 
compared to the uh, the person or the company like 3M or uh, DuPont who manufactured the chemicals themselves and then sold them to other folks who use them. So uh, at some point in time, it is a very appropriate to hold those polluters and those folks who knew a lot more about this long before the general public did, hold them responsible for the damage that's been done. Uh, and I think you s you've seen this with the tobacco industry, you're seeing it now with the opioid uh, epidemic. There will come a, a time where those folks will have to um, take more responsibility and that means you know some fiscal responsibility uh, especially um, but the truth is that is still not going to be enough to fix the problem all by itself so we also need to um, uh, make sure that we're putting things in place so that uh, we change the way that we look at um, the chemicals that are used in manufacturing and in, in even uh, we haven't even talked about firefighting foam but this is one of the uh, that's one of the main ways that this uh, chemical gets into our waterways and into our environment is by spraying it on fires or uh, importantly and disturbingly to me by practicing for fires that have not happened uh, so that they know how to use it in case of a fire um, but the, those chemicals have just seeped into our water aquifers and rivers and um, uh, eventually into our drinking water and groundwater, uh, surface water as well. So anyway, there's, uh, there's just a lot that needs to be done on that from uh, everyone's perspective. Uh, and so, um, yeah, it's just going to require a lot of con uh, cooperation from all levels. And I kind of wandered around there with your question, but um, if I didn't answer it, just ask again. No, that's okay. Um, um, in addition, I mean, the Great Lakes is, I mean, we're known for water. Um, so can you talk a little bit about um, just water as a finite resource and why this should really matter a lot? Well, um, National Wildlife uh, Federation just came out with a uh, PFAS uh, report on the Great Lakes. And that's downloadable from the uh, NFW's uh, website. but. Uh, the Great Lakes are a major source of, of fresh water, and the city of Grand Rapids, a uh, lot of municipalities, city of Chicago, um, Detroit, all of the uh, major cities get uh, fresh water from the Great Lakes. Uh, aquifers feed into the Great Lakes, rivers feed into the Great Lakes, the whole water cycle occurs. But um, we actually have small levels of these PFAS chemicals in the Great Lakes that we can measure. So uh, we have to stop the, uh, the discharge of these materials uh, coming into the Great Lakes. Uh, water is a, uh, is a finite resource and groundwater is even more of a finite resource. And most people think that since we're so close to Lake Michigan, uh, groundwater isn't, uh, isn't an issue, but uh, in Ottawa County, you know, right in our backyards, we have uh, issues with the major aquifer because people are drawing it down. And who would have thought that, uh, you know, five or 10 years ago? So um, we need the water to, uh, for tourism, we need it for drinking, and anytime you have a chemical, it very prevalent in you know products um, and in uh, waste in wastewater. Anytime you have a chemical that spreads the way PFAS does, it's going to affect our uh, surface water and our groundwater resources. Um, Senator Brinks, will you talk a little bit about the meeting um, and the turnout in the Rockford area in April um, for the DEQ and? Rock Sure. I've uh, never seen larger crowds than I have uh, in northern Kent County uh, in various places, usually high school gymnasiums. Uh, but it was like a scene out of, uh, what's the movie? Aaron Brockovich. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I know you guys are young. Uh, it's worth it's worth watching, um, and, but it's it's an example of uh, sort of a citizen who got herself informed and uh, took a took on big uh, big water pollution and and won right. Um, It'd be nice if our story was that simple and it could end with a million dollar settlement and took care of everything. Uh, that's not going to be the case. Uh, but anyway, there it was, uh, you know, crowds a la Aaron Brockovich style. And um, 
people are just really, really, really concerned. They have a lot of questions. And uh, I will say that um, one of the reasons I kept getting phone calls early on especially is because uh, people believed government was not being responsive to them, was not being honest with them, and they believed that about um, uh, the company that had polluted as well. And so they really uh, felt like they were getting the runaround, and to a certain extent they were. Um, then there were folks that just didn't engage because they didn't understand it and thought, well, this will pass, right? That's not going to happen. Uh, so um, I think the bottom line for me in terms of citizen engagement is that you know this impacts people's uh, people's lives in such essential and basic ways. Uh, it impacts fertility, people's ability to get pregnant. It impacts immunity, we believe, right? So there's more and more evidence. So there's your protection from disease, right? So you've, if you are a 55-year-old person whose spouse just died of cancer, you have a lot of questions. Uh, and this just really hit home for people. There are decades of exposure in certain families. Grandparents who came to me and said, I, give, I gave my grandchildren water from this faucet. Was I feeding them something that will harm them, right? And uh, there are people who, who have to decide if they're going to work for 10 more years or work for five more years. And knowing that they've drank highly contaminated water uh, in, certain f in, in certain places, recognizing that they may have a much higher likelihood of getting some of these, uh, these deadly diseases, but they don't really know. I mean, there's so much we don't know. So this really is impacting people's ability to make decisions and to really sort of fulfill their hopes and dreams and live the life that they've planned for. Um, property values is another thing. Right? There are people who, um, uh, one family in the middle of a divorce, they were trying to sell their, their primary asset, their home. They couldn't sell it for what it was worth at all. So in addition to all of their concerns about their health, their family issues, now they've got additional financial troubles because of that. Um, those people want to know who's responsible. And if we can figure out who's responsible, they would like some, some remediation for that. And the government has a role in that. The legal system has a role in that. Um, and the bottom line, I think, is at the very least, when we know as government uh, actors, whatever our role is, whether we're elected or we work for government or um, uh, even uh, for a state university, when we have knowledge of things, we need to be honest with our constituents. We need to be straightforward about what we can and cannot do what we'd like to try to do, uh, and make sure that we are listening to them so that they feel heard, and that we bring that uh, back to the table when we are making decisions, whether it's how we allocate uh, tax dollars to make sure that we're using those to the best of our ability to address those issues, or if it's uh, about setting policies to protect people from this kind of um, catastrophe in the future. So it's, it's all uh, um, a lot harder after Flint and it's a lot harder after we started the way we did with PFAS with people feeling like nobody's listening to us. And I'll, I'll add the biggest offender in, of this in my uh, book and in, in anecdotal evidence talking with people who've come to me is the federal government and the Department of Defense. They have just been absolutely impossible to work with. And even when it's absolutely clear that they uh, know the problem and that they are responsible, they are refusing to take any responsibility and to make uh, um, amends with those communities around those military bases. Uh, and it is really causing a lot of uh, resentment among citizens. So it becomes more and more difficult when you see that cycle for us as policymakers who genuinely care and are trying to make a difference. Uh, when we start out with people not trusting us, it makes it that much harder. What is it about the military bases that creates such a high concentration of the PFAS? Um, most of them are Air Force bases, and they uh, had quite a bit of uh, firefighting training. Um, I'm very familiar with uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. I grew up down in that area, and they actually had burned out airplanes where they would you know, torch them or fill them with, with uh, jet fuel and then try and put them out with the, with the foam. 
So if, if you look at uh, Wordsmith Air Force Base, you can see two major plumes where they had major air uh, uh, fires where the planes, you know, I don't know what happened when they landed or took off or something, but um, where they sprayed the foam on there to put the fire out. And uh, people aren't careful, of, <laughs> you know, when, when you're trying to put out, you know, gasoline or aviation fuel, you don't really care how much foam you use. And typically they'll wash it down with water afterwards, which helps spread it. So um, we have a lot of glacial till here, which uh, is very permeable, so the material spreads in those aquifers. And uh, we have plumes that are miles and miles long. And we have plumes that typically uh, a plume is the area of contamination coming off of a site. And some of these plumes are going underneath the rivers. So um, typically the surface water bodies intercept these plumes, but PFAS is uh, going underneath. Uh, it's going underneath the Rogue River and it went underneath Lake Van Etten. It's coming out on the other side and going to Lake Huron. So um, from a geolo geological standpoint, these are really uh, hard to uh, study and hard to get our hands around. We're, we're trying to get some money in the budget for um, geological survey, surveying so that we have better information about uh, um, what's going on under the surface. We have really old data that we've been using and uh, a lot of times when they're looking at where water goes, uh, you know, sometimes um, uh, certainly a manufacturer or something who recognizes that they may have a problem with this, if they look at their whole site and they say, well, this is uphill from that, and so we figure that this must be going down there, and maybe that's why there's an issue down there, but really you can't necessarily tell which direction the groundwater is going and how permeable that ground was unless you know what's under the surface, right? So it depends if it's sandy or gravelly or clay. It, it makes a difference how it travels. And so we just don't have enough information. We've got really old data. It's very surfacey. It doesn't go very deep. So we're trying to get much better geologic mapping. And so we're trying to get some money to start that surveying. Um, so that it will help us understand better w how these chemicals are moving potentially if we understand which direction water is naturally moving. And we know a lot, we just don't know enough. Um, but one of the advantages uh, that I'm really excited about that is um, that we would uh, make it kind of open source so available to the public. So if there's, you know, reporters or academics or um, companies that are trying to, in good faith, remediate or understand their impact on the environment, uh, they will have we can all be working from the same playbook and having a better understanding of what we're dealing with. Uh, and we can quit wasting resources in some senses by guessing and digging a hole and testing over here. Guessing again, testing over there. Guessing again, you know, go a little further. We can learn a lot, but not enough. So that's one thing I think that is really concrete that we could do. Um, but yeah, that's, it's, it's just really difficult with the, the, um, the DOD to get them to admit that, you know, when there's a chemical they used on their base for decades that's showing up on the other side of the lake right next to them, they'll say, well, that's, that's uh, over the wire or something. They have a, a phrase, something that's on the other side of the wire, well, it, and it's not our problem anymore. Well, it's clearly there wasn't a, a cottage owner on the other side of that lake that used firefighting foam to put out a fire. And, you know, it's, it was clearly that's where it's coming from. You know, 99% chance, and they still will not admit it or take responsibility. So it took the state coming in and providing water filters for those homes on that lake, uh, and trying to go back and sue the Department of Defense to make them take some responsibility, and it's it's nearly impossible. I was just going to ask, what is the long term? Who's responsible for? Is this just going to be like settled in court, or do you see corporations that are? Um, you know, maybe stepping up or trying to um, help with this effort? Because you keep talking about the money coming from the state and we have to find money for this. And, you know, and if, you know, the state didn't put that there. So, like, what are what are the rest of us supposed to think about that when we're the ones right. voting and buying? Yeah. And yeah, so, I mean, that's a huge concern of mine, right? Um, most people sitting in this room have nothing to do with the fact that there's PFAS all over the place in, um, the, in the state and you know, in, in concentrations around um, especially auto manufacturing or plating areas. If you happen to live there and you um, uh, are exposed to that, it's not very comforting to realize that 
um, they're not facing any additional ramifications at this point uh, in terms of paying for the pollution that they caused to the rest of us. So uh, it's important, I think, that we do use the, the legal system to go back and hold um, companies accountable for when they did know what they knew, when they knew it, and make sure that they um, take some responsibility for, uh, one, providing clean water systems. So I know there's a big legal battle right now going on uh, with Wolverine trying to get them to extend city water to those homes that are on wells. Uh, so that they can uh, have clean water that's treated by a system that we know is testing uh, uh, for either very low or, or low uh, levels of PFAS or none. Um, so the city of Grand Rapids, for instance, or the city of uh, Plainfield, their water's being filtered so they get this, but there's um, wells that uh, are still serve those thousand wells serving those homes. Uh, they have to continuously filter uh, individually uh, and they have to replace those filters every so often. If their well fil fails, uh, the health department should not approve a new well in that aquifer with that contamination. So really the long-term solution has to involve those companies being willing to say, yes, we take some responsibility for this, you know, these miles here, it's highly likely that we contaminated it and we're going to contribute to fixing it for these homeowners. Um, they're very unwilling to do that at this point. It's very expensive, I get it, um, but uh, it is not those homeowners' fault and they should not be the only ones uh, footing that bill. So uh, we will have to use legal um, recourse, but we also will have to have public policy and I think this is a huge thing. We need to quit giving chemicals the benefit of the doubt before we let all of these manufacturers and um, uh, people use them. And, and I will admit freely, I have products that I love that have PFAS in them. Uh, and so as we have all purchased these things, unwittingly participating in the pollution of our own environment because we didn't know, there are people who did know a lot earlier than us. Uh, and so we need to quit giving those chemicals the benefit of the doubt, ask those manufacturers and those producers of those chemicals or inventors of these man-made chemicals to prove that they are safe before they are allowed to just use them indiscriminately uh, um, without dealing with the waste that they cause. So there may be a good use for PFAS in certain very limited circumstances. To save you know, uh, thousands of people from a, a gasoline fire seems like a legitimate trade-off maybe, uh, but to practice for fires that don't exist, eh, don't think so, right? So we need to make policies about that that um, hold them responsible so that we get less of it in our environment. We need to require um, proof that things are safe rather than, uh, so a precautionary uh, frame rather than a reactionary frame after people have already gotten sick. Uh, and so some of that comes down to the legal system, again, because in, uh, in the U.S. we generally wait for harm to be done, and then we ask for things to get fixed, rather than saying you have to show us that this is safe before you put it out there. So it's, it's complex, it's difficult, um, but the bottom line is those companies, those manufacturers, and uh, 3M, DuPont, Chem Wars, those are the, the big names of the, the folks who came up with these chemicals. They have to take some serious responsibility. They have a lot of money. They can contribute in ways that uh, the average taxpayer cannot. Um, but on the other side of that, we will all be contributing to it because we're already all, you know, in Grand Rapids now, they're testing for it. They're watching for it. They have to filter it out. Um, was it Grand Haven? They had 40 parts per trillion, I think. Oh, hey. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, they, they, were, they had to move where they were getting their water out of the Great Lakes, basically. So, um, you know, w Grand Rapids, our parts per trillion were smaller, uh, in, in part, most likely, because we were getting our water from farther out in the lake, and it was more diluted. Um, so, you know, there are things like that that we're all paying for in terms of our public systems uh, in small amounts on our bills every single day. That's never going to be enough to cover the whole thing. So we need to uh, uh, find other ways to do that, too. Well, let's pause just for a second because somebody just got here. Hot off, hot off the presses. <laughs> Thanks for making it. This is Representative Rachel Hood. Um, she's a state rep who's serving her first term representing the 76th House District, which covers a large section of Grand Rapids, including my own, so thank you for your service. Um, mm -hmm. Hood has spent her entire career developing, financing, and implementing innovative ur urban investment, water protection, and energy conservation solutions. 
um, a lifelong advocate for our environment. She spent a decade as the executive director for WEMIAC, West Michigan Environmental Action Council, um, where she helped form the Grand Rapids Stormwater Asset Management Strategies, developed a watershed education program, which served a bunch of students, which is super awesome, thank you, and uh, innovated clean energy programs and policy. Um, most recently, you served as a strategist for um, the Dig Deep Initiative. Is that correct? Am I saying that right? It's research a company. Yeah. Company, Dig Deep Research, um, which helps municipalities find and secure millions for funding in water and infrastructure improvements. Um, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for making it over here. I know it's yeah. been a busy day for you. I'm sorry. I was, I was held up in session this afternoon. We're trying to get a budget done here in Michigan. So uh, I had to prioritize making that happen, but I'm glad to be here with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Can we get you to weigh in on something right away? Are you ready? Let's go. OK. Um, so can you talk to me a little bit in the audience here about why, this, why you have such a passion around this issue in general, water in general? I mean, you've s your whole entire career has been wrapped in this. So can you talk to us a little bit what inspires you? Sure. Um, I believe we live in an incredibly special place on the globe. Um, we are surrounded by 20% of the world's uh, freshwater supply. Accessible potable water uh, isn't easy to come by. And as a result of that, um, we see conflict emerging throughout the globe. Um, in the context of climate change, this water resource becomes ever more important. I believe that we already are uh, um, a home to climate refugees and that we will see more climate refugees coming to the Great Lakes uh, in the years ahead of us. And, um, and that compels me to, uh, to protect the, the lakes as, as water bodies, um, but um, also what I often refer to as our sixth lake, our, our groundwater supply. Um, becomes critically important. Even without that global context in mind, uh, the lakes uh, support our, our top industries. Our accessible fresh water supports uh, manufacturing, it supports agriculture, it supports tourism, all of which are you know water dependent industries. Um, so I believe that our um, competitiveness into uh, the 21st century is dependent on fresh water. And I believe that like, threats like, like PFAS and other persistent contaminants, invasive species, it can, I can go on and on, <laughs> um, are all, all really deep threats um, to, uh, to that asset, to our way of life, to the inheritance of fresh water that I hope to leave to my children and yours. And, uh, and that has driven my career. So why should the rest of us care then? Uh, we are water. You you are Lake Michigan. I'm Lake Michigan. If if you don't care about the health of our water, you aren't um, able to care for yourself. Um, it's it's this really fundamental uh, connection. Um, there's this quote I love from Rachel Carson. Um, she said, "In nature, nothing exists alone." And uh, we are nothing without our, our water supply. Um, and it's, it's just that basic for me. Dr. Radisky, would you mind weighing in on why this is a passion project for you and why this is so important to you to research? Well, um, I think the, what, what makes this, this different is that uh, I've had a chance to get to know a number of the people that are actually exposed to these chemicals. and. Uh, once you start associating a person with uh, contamination, it, it's altogether different. And uh, my initial involvement with the uh, Concerned Citizens Group in Rockford, um, I uh, really got to know the, the passion of those, you know, three citizens. And uh, just, just seeing the fact that uh, this chemical was um, disposed of ever since the 50s um, in the Rockford area, and people were drinking water. The, the um, tannery had a discharge into the uh, 
into the Rogue River and people were drinking, the, the Rockford had their drinking water you know, downstream of that, so uh, there was an exposure there. Um, so I'm really concerned about it because it's, uh, it's, it's everywhere and it's affecting everybody and just the fact that I've gotten to know some of the people that are exposed. Um, I've gotten to know people up in Oscoda that uh, have their property ruined. And uh, in, in Michigan, if uh, you have a well, uh, if, if your drinking water well is over 70, you're considered a Part 201 site. You're a hazardous waste site. Those people's homes are hazardous waste sites. Um, and the home is your, you know, is, is your sanctuary and is your greatest investment. So um, when you start seeing the, the personal tragedies uh, of how it's affecting it, um, I've gotten much more vocal and much more active in terms of uh, the effects of these chemicals. Could you talk a little bit to um, legacy concerns? I know we have talked a little bit about the short-term health impacts that are potentially mm -hmm. um, occurring, but what do you think is, like, what's a legacy problem that we're probably going to be looking at, or can you make a hypothesis? Well, the, the legacy issue is that uh, people have been exposed uh, ever since uh, the 50s and 60s, so it's multiple generations, so we, we do have legacy issues, and we're only getting to the point now where we can understand and, and start looking at the health effects. So we've certainly got legacy contamination issues. The, the plumes have spread for, for miles and miles. And uh, like I said, we're only starting to understand the, uh, the health effects of, of these chemicals. Every, um, every day there is a new study that's pointing to the fact that we should limit these materials. So it, it comes down to... Uh, us as consumers, and you know, <laughs> in my news feed this morning, there was a uh, article that said that Home Depot is no longer selling carpet with PFAS or, or fluorine compounds in it. So, uh, as consumers, we can drive the uh, banning of these chemicals, or we can, with our own pocketbooks, uh, make sure that we don't buy materials that contain these fluorinated compounds. So. Um, I'm very active in terms of uh, trying to get people, educate people about these chemicals and seek fluorine-free alternatives uh, and, you know, use that with your pocketbook. Don't buy the materials that contain fluorine, so. Representative Hood, would you mind talking just a little bit about your history with um, the legislation that you have worked with for, toward, um, since, uh, you know, coming into office? I know your Facebook. I watch your Facebook Live all the time, your videos. Um, so would you mind speaking to what you're trying to do and going forward? Uh, sure. Uh, so I, um, Senator Brinks and I are members of the Progressive Women's Caucus, uh, which is a, a caucus of women serving in the legislature who are working on women's issues. Um, they're the environmental health um, uh, task force of the caucus, and we are um, preparing a package of bills that um, look at the consumer side of uh, of the equation for PFAS, um, in addition to uh, a s uh, some bills that look at um, uh, precautionary rules for the state of, of Michigan, trying to um, uh, use some practices that we see in other places in the world to make better decisions, uh, more informed decisions about what sorts of um, chemicals we bring into our environment um, ahead of the game. Because we haven't had precautionary rules uh, in the United States, you know, we're chasing after these issues, and of course the harm has already been, been done, as, uh, as Dr. Radowski stated. Um, so I, I think the, in looking at kind of the, the first flush of, of bills, there's been a lot of uh, work coming out of MPART, which is the collaborative body um, working across state agencies on these issues. And, um, and there's, there's been progress, but it's been slow. Um, at, and s the senator can attest to that because she has more history in the legislature. Um, and uh, we have also been um, using House resolutions to communicate with federal partners 
um, asking the feds to to fund our work to address PFAS, asking the feds to set limits, um, uh, trying to do what we can to move uh, move the issue both up the chain um, at the federal government level and then uh, here in the state of Michigan as well. Um, my history, though, dates back to uh, even before we knew uh, that that this was PFAS. Um, I was uh, honored to be approached by some of the citizens. Um, Rick mentioned when I served as the director at, at Wemiac, and um, and I, I we were one of the first institutions that actually believed them, um, <laughs> and and started to to help to to bring resources around the issue, connect the citizens to experts who were able to accelerate their progress moving forward. Um, we began some accountability discussions with the city of Rockford. That was a very interesting um, experience. <laughs> and, um, and at first we were looking, um, we were looking at kind of traditional tannery uh, contaminants uh, like arsenic and uh, chromium and uh, I think some sulfides, yeah, yeah. ammonia. Um, and we knew that there was a significant issue that it had been covered up and that we, we didn't know the whole extent of the problem. And our goal was really just to begin um, the process of peeling back the, the layers of the onion um, and uh, in creating space for the EPA to come in and the DEQ um, to remain present there and to really do their work um, because even those efforts had been blocked for quite some time. Um, and I can say that even before we heard from people directly in Rockford, I was aware that citizens um, were concerned about you know, cancer clusters that were discussed informally across the community. Um, Rockford is a community that rapidly developed during the 70s and 80s. And so there were people whose families had, you know, farmed that land and they knew that uh, grandpa came home with big barrels of some mystery something, sludge or, you know, toxic chemicals and that grandpa dumped that, you know, in, in the back ditch on the property, right? And then they saw neighborhoods develop around those properties. And then they saw uh, families struggling with, uh, with leukemias and, and, and other cancers. So um, it, it, I have chills right now actually thinking about all of the years that the people of Rockford understood that there was an issue and nobody listened to them. It was, I, w I would characterize that as a 20 year um, issue in and of itself. All of the work to protect those jobs at Wolverine. Um. I am one of those uh, households on in Kent County in Rockford that is on those wells that have PFAS in it and we have the ginormous filter in uh, my, my house. I'm also a faculty at Grand Valley State University in cell molecular biology department. So when I first found out about this PFAS thing, of course, the first thing I did was go read all the scientific papers, right? And then I, I went to speak to legislators, but uh, <laughs> I find it kind of frustrating that it's very difficult to communicate to legislators, uh, politicians in general, um, using scientific language, right? So like, what would you recommend uh, as a good way to communicate or uh, are, you know, like, I know the data. I know that you know. I've been feeding my three-year-old in this bottle, you know, feeding the bottle water all his all his life when I found out about this, right? And so, like, what is the best way to advocate for a citizens? Um, what's the best way to communicate with with legislators? Because I don't I don't think like the numbers and not all of them are number people. I guess I don't know how the best. Thank you for doing it <laughs> right this second, actually. So that's a good question. How how to how to make the um, the lines of communication open and you know in such a way of speaking.
the legislature. There's dozens. hard to see the trends in what um, are the really important topics that must be addressed, whether we like them or not. Um, so some of that you have to get through. Um, there are still colleagues of ours who say, oh, just tell me what I have to do and I'll do it. And you know, tell me how I have to vote. You, I'm not, I'll let you understand PFAS and then just tell me if there's a bill how I should vote. So they don't want to or don't have the bandwidth to or maybe it just doesn't make sense to them because they don't have that kind of brain, like they're not numbers people, as you say. I have a lot of other uh, phrases that I use to describe my colleagues, um, which I will not share with you. But the, um, uh, so it is, it's very difficult, but help, helping people understand, um, you know, why they should care. And so for different people, that's going to be a different reason, right? Um, for some people, it's understanding there are people in their district who are dealing with this and hearing a very personal story about how they've been impacted um, them and their children are hearing the story that you just told about, you know, giving your child three years worth of water and wondering how this little body is, you know, processing that and, and whether or not that will have health impacts. Um, that's something that could be with them for the rest of his life, right? And helping, uh, uh, that may move one legislator. Another legislator may be like, I just need the facts. How much is it going to cost me to clean this up? Um, so it does take time. Uh, what you are doing is good. Um, almost all uh, state legislators have coffee hours in their districts, and so uh, wherever you live, you can look that up online and try and get to those coffee hours and go talk to them about any issue that's important to you, but this is certainly one where you can come share your story. That can make an impact if they know it's not coming from Sierra Club, whom they may or may not like, um, or coming from the manufacturers, who they may or may not like. I mean, they're getting information from multiple sources, from people, and it is conflicting information. Um, and so for them to really understand the truth of the situation and how that's impacting their constituents, I think that's a really important connection to make. And so you certainly started down that road, um, and I would encourage you to continue to do that. But um, to communicate with us uh, as often as you can about things that are really important to you, uh, when they finally uh, understand that you know this is an issue that can't be ignored, it, it will sink in eventually. It's just different for different people. It's different for different people. What motivates some will not motivate others. So I think it's just important to try and uh, make a difference in any way that you can and to tell your story. Um, I think ultimately most politicians do care about their constituents and uh, they may have different uh, philosophies about what government's role is in addressing that, but they do want to know uh, when a constituent's being harmed and if a state can do something to fix it, I think most politicians are willing to have that conversation, uh, in my experience, not all, but most. And so um, I think it does help. Um, and we are starting to learn, I, I argue with this term, they uh, call it in the industry an emerging contaminant. And I have a hard time with that because it's been in use for 60 years. Uh, it's not really emerging. What's emerging is our knowledge of it and its impact on us. Uh, and so I, um, I do think though, uh, as our knowledge grows on this, uh, we will have a much, you'll, it'll be a lot easier for you to talk to legislators this year than it was two years ago or three years ago. And I can see that already with colleagues. Outside of one-to-one -one communication, can you, both of you have had a vast experience with um, constituent groups. Could you talk about, you know, um, consolidating efforts or messaging and then and then going to state representatives, et cetera? Would you mind talking a little bit about that with your background? Yeah, so in addition to um, coffee hours, and, and I echo uh, Senator Brink's statement that coffee hours are a great time to get to legislators. It's often a moment where we're a little more relaxed and we don't have a, you know, 15 minute blocks of, you know, of, of meetings. Um, so it's a time where uh, the legislator can get a little more context and be able to, you know, ask questions and, and go a little deeper. Um, but other, other ways, uh, you know, groups often come to uh, Lansing and, uh, and, and meet with us, sometimes for 15 minutes, sometimes for a half an hour. Um, in this context, you want to come prepared with a, a brief one-page document that's scannable. 
um, that provides really high level of uh, information about the issue. And then um, typically as, as a, when I was an advocate, you know, on the other side of that, I would back that particular one pager up with some, some really good evidence, right? A couple of articles from trusted sources, maybe a page of links that are broken out on some of the subtopics. Um, so in this case, you know, you might want to have links about PFAS and human health, you know, PFAS and uh, uh, groundwater supply, PFAS remediation practices, right? And, and a few links where um, their staff or the legislator themselves can can look deeper into the issue, learn more, and gain a sense of um, of this issue being uh, supported, being documented in some meaningful way. Um, follow up then is critical. I think um, you know squeaky wheels, right? Get the grease. And, um, and maintaining decorum through that. We talk a lot about civility, which is a word that I believe is very much abused. Um, people have the right to be angry. People have absolutely, you know, I mean, if this happened to you, you would be angry too, right? Um, but uh, when, you know, when you're entering into these spaces, you need, um, you need to be able to articulate something um, with uh, with emotion that captures somebody, but not with emotion that alienates somebody, right? You don't want somebody to feel scared or threatened um, because what do people do when they feel scared or threatened? They shut down. Um, so keeping that door open, keeping it positive as even in the you know worst contexts and um, and then, uh, consistent follow up and follow through. I have a another hairy issue related to child welfare that um, I'm working on, and uh, the woman who is advocating for herself and for uh, com her communities, um, she sends me a text every week to check in and see how I'm doing, how how it's going. Sometimes it's just like good week, bad week, you know, <laughs> but she's present with me. Um, and uh, that accountability has, has been crucial to keep my staff moving, to keep me moving and focused on this issue when I have 20 other issues that I could spend my attention on, right? Um, I think uh, social media is uh, another space where you can engage um, your legislators, but again, uh, being really thoughtful about keeping the dialogue positive, fact-based, um, uh, keeping it about making progress instead of uh, making, um, trying to make somebody feel embarrassed or trying to, you know, people use social media in really negative ways. I'm sure you've all experienced that. Um, you can also use it in positive ways. Any other thoughts? Uh, I was going to add that there's some uh, organizations out there doing some pretty good advocacy work that monitor legislation, so um, not everybody's going to be able to review every bill introduced, but they will filter through those and look at relevant legislation, and they will uh, weigh in on it. Um, League of Conservation Voters does some accountability work as well as uh, that monitoring work on legislation. Uh, so they'll watch what's introduced. They'll um, sometimes testify and uh, let legislators know uh, that they would like a yes or a no on this bill or that this is a good idea or a bad idea or help improve a proposed uh, solution to a problem. So you can monitor that, uh, and that can help give you some communication points to talk with your legislators about. Um, Sierra Club also does some work uh, that is very similar to that. They will come into our offices and talk to us about specific issues and specific bills. They'll come testify in committee, uh, which can be helpful. Uh, but they will also have information on their websites that helps distill this and, and put it in a way that normal people can understand. Uh, that's, uh, you know, there's a lot of wonderful things about a citizen legislature, but the uh, downside of a citizen legislature is we're just citizens and we aren't scientists, and so we aren't going to understand all of this. Um, without looking through it a few times and having it distilled for us in ways that make sense uh, in uh, the things that matter to us uh, that we're faced with making our decisions every day. Um, so I would encourage you to get involved in those groups. Uh, Michigan 
Environmental Council also has done some work. And who just did the article? Uh, Wildlife Federation, yes. Uh, and so there are various places. Uh, also, the MPART website is actually pretty helpful in understanding what the state has done and what we've discovered about where the contamination is. Uh, so if you have questions about that, um, I know for a fact there are legislators who have not studied the MPART website. Uh, but in every single one of our districts, uh, I'm pretty sure every single one of our districts has a contamination dot or a likely contamination spot in uh, our districts. And many legislators aren't even aware of that. So you can use those kinds of resources to make sure that you're well informed and use some of their materials to help communicate so you don't have to invent the wheel because um, uh, what Representative Hood uh, shared about what to present to a legislator, all very good, totally accurate. Some people have already put that together for us and it can be very helpful to um, put that information together um, but those are also great ways for you to get involved on the other side of things you can talk to us but we aren't the only way to make a difference um, certainly citizen groups uh, can do things with their local city commissions county commissions uh, counties for instance often have landfills uh, they're responsible for the leachate that comes out of those often full of contaminants uh, how they are managing it um, is a, a function of county government um, and their response to it can make a huge difference in communities. Um, same with city commissions in terms of managing their water supplies responsibly. So there's a lot of different ways that you can communicate with people um, and sharing some of those other resources that they may not be aware of as city commissioners or county commissioners can be really helpful. Dr. Rudisky. Yeah. Um, I think as a, as a scientist, um, I'm certainly challenged with how to communicate all the intricacies of, of PFAS to people. And uh, we're actually starting a dialogue uh, on campus. I have <laughs> two faculty members sitting there that uh, we're, we're trying to figure out the best way to communicate um, the science of PFAS to uh, stakeholder groups, to the public. So I think um, that is really challenging. And the only way to, to do that is to keep practicing and, and learning from experience. But I think we're, we're trying to do that. Um, the second thing is uh, we've just started a citizens group, uh, the community advisory group for the Rockford uh, contamination. Um, we're, we meet uh, tomorrow night at uh, Plainfield Township Hall, 6 to 8 p.m. And we've got uh, 20 board members on this group. And there was probably another 30 people, 40 people that showed up in the audience. And uh, the whole purpose of that group is to uh, make sure that we have the ability to comment on what's going on as far as the cleanup, the EPA's involved, the Eagles involved, and we want to make sure the citizens have a uh, right, uh, have a uh, voice in the cleanup. It's not just negotiated between Wolverine and the, the DEQ. So, uh, getting involved with that citizens group, I think, is really important, and then trying to start other ones for uh, sites that are out there, like uh, the airport and. Uh, Plainfield Township has uh, issues with state disposal landfill. So um, I think the more uh, citizens can coalesce and uh, express the science, express their concerns uh, with decorum, I think that's really important, um, the more uh, we're going we're gonna to influence people to take action. We have a question from the audience. So I was just wondering, what are some precautions that we can take to prevent getting exposed to PFAS? And then once we figure out like the plume dimensions, how far they've gone, how does that help us? And what like what are we going to do with that information? Well, once we find out uh, where the plume's going, then we can uh, do what's called remediation, where we can. Uh, set up uh, wells to extract the water so the w it doesn't move anymore, and then we can treat that water and, and put clean water back into the aquifers. So uh, it's really important for us to de define uh, where the contamination is, how it's moving, and then once we know that, we can uh, put in treatment systems for that. So that's, uh, and it's, it's like playing battleship. Um, you don't know what's going on or underneath the ground, so you do put in wells and you have to look at the data. So it's going to take five years to uh, hopefully characterize uh, all these waste sites. The site um, above House, House Street is one of the major contamination areas in Rockford. There's another area called Woven Jewel. 
and that's where the uh, waste was dumped in a gravel pit. There's four different flumes coming off that gravel pit in different directions. And uh, three of those are going right to the Rogue River at different areas. So uh, the geology is, is pretty complex. The, um, every municipality that has a water system in the state was tested for PFAS levels. Is it everyone? Yes. So, and, and uh, as were schools and daycare centers. Do you know if the universities have uh, tested? Well, we're a part of the Grand Rapids Water. So, okay, so you can, uh, you, there's, it's knowable how much, how many parts per trillion are in your, your municipal water and you can uh, call your city and you can ask. I don't know if it's all posted online somewhere. It, it's on the Impart website. So that's one of those helpful uh, places that, or pieces of information you can find there. It's pretty in-depth information on the Impart website. So you can, you can have some certainty that if you're drinking Grand Rapids water that uh, it is either non-detect or very uh, few parts per trillion and it should be under, I believe it was under five when they tested it the first time when I heard results. Um, and uh, our testing is getting a little bit better too so that we can get down to non-detect. It used to be a little bit harder, but um, we're getting better at it. Um, so you, you should have some comfort that the municipal systems in uh, the state of Michigan have been tested and they're, they're remediating if they were over or they're finding a different source of water, uh, like in Parchment near Kalamazoo, they uh, hooked up to Kalamazoo water. Um, and other cities that found that they were above the uh, uh, limits that they were comfortable with uh, would figure out different places to get their water so that they could uh, either get better water to begin with or uh, filter it out. If, um, if you're on a well, uh, then you would want to do testing. So some of you, you know, if uh, you have a home outside of a city water system or perhaps you grew up in a home outside of a city water system, um, you would be uh, able to uh, approach your county health department um, to, to get information about uh, the, the PFAS levels in your area and determine if you need to test your well. Um, and then from a avoidance and, and uh, a, a perspective, um, obviously PFAS is in a lot of products. It's in um, food packaging, it's in cosmetics, um, it's in clothing. Uh, so getting educated about how you can change your purchasing practices in order to avoid um, PFAS exposures is, uh, is something that I would recommend as well. Um, so like, I mean, for really obvious reasons, you should buy broccoli that isn't packaged in styrofoam, but now we have another reason to, you know, to avoid the, that kind of um, heavily packaged food product. Um, not all food products that are packaged have PFAS, but um, uh, they're present, you know, it's been present in can linings, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So, um, I, you know, I recommend buying fresh food as much as you can, as directly from the farmer as you can, um, and, uh, and, and trying to avoid some of those packaging materials uh, until we get to a point where we're starting to, to require companies to pull those materials out of their packaging. I had a question about what we can do as citizens on a daily basis to reverse the effects of of these externalities by industry, just things uh, like one or two from each of you that we can each implement in our own lives to uh, make the water cleaner in what ways we can. <laughs> I get first. <laughs> um, I, I, I think you, you need to be uh, be aware, more aware of uh, what, what's in the products that we buy. And I, I think um, less is more in a lot of cases. Um, as uh, uh, Representative Hood said about buying uh, things locally, um, foods and things like that. But um, you really have to be in informed about the, the pervasiveness of chemicals. And we do have a program at Grand Valley on green chemistry. Um, how to uh, 
engineer chemicals so they don't cause these problems. And we have some of the best uh, businesses uh, in West Michigan. Uh, a company like uh, Herman Miller, for example, takes uh, all of its product, uh, when it ships you office furniture, it, it uh, takes your old office furniture back and recycles it. The fabric is compostable. Um, they, they take the boxes that, you, that they ship with and take them back. So uh, supporting companies that uh, are looking at uh, life cycle analysis of, of their products. So uh, just, just becoming more aware of, of, of good companies and then not, uh <laughs> and I don't want to say bad companies beca because uh, a lot of, um, you know, the, the situation in the Huron River, there's 150 miles of, of river, the Huron River, that are contaminated with PFAS. A plating company was, was putting uh, a PFAS product on top of their um, plating vats to, to make sure the hexavalent chromium fumes didn't cause a problem to its workers. I don't think they were really aware of what they were doing, um, but uh, you know, I, I don't want to come down an industry you know, totally, but uh, there are companies in the know and we just have to support them. And get a better understanding of how chemicals are in society. Really, I mean, uh, you asked for a couple of practical things you can do every day. But what I'd really like some of you in this room to do is, you know, go through that course of study that he was talking about. That really transforms how we do not just um, uh, chemistry, but how we do business uh, in ways that keep all of these things in mind. Uh, your generation, I have uh, three children, uh, uh, all daughters between 18 and 23, and your generation's awareness of um, everything from climate change to contaminants to um, materialism is just, and its impact on all of this conversation is just a lot better than previous generations. I mean, we had some sense, and we we're moving in the right direction, uh, not fast enough, right? But uh, people your age get it in a way that's real to your lives, that's going to matter um, in really important ways. So I would encourage you to to look at things and transform the way we do things. Look at less, not just less harmful alternatives, but safe alternatives. Um, you know, I. I could barely walk past my camping equipment for months without just getting a little sick to my stomach because I know there's PFAS in there because it's all waterproof, right? And I have Chaco shoes that I love, and those are made at Wolverine. And uh, I don't know what else I've got, but I'm sure I am a, a very guilty consumer who unwittingly participated in this. And we can change that. Um, and I th the bottom line is people have a right to have clean water. Um, and we have a right to expect that the government is um, playing a role in making sure that the products we buy, assuming they're safe, actually are safe, right? And you guys are in this great position at this moment in history to understand how we got here and to look at things differently and make sure that we don't continue to pay this price without meaning to. Um, and there are so many things that make our lives better, right? So PFAS is actually in some medical equipment that saves lives, right? There are uses for some of these things that are legitimate, but we should be using it only when absolutely necessary, not because I didn't want wet feet, right? Um, so you, you have that opportunity every single day by being an informed consumer, but in order to really transform it so that not everybody has to be, uh, you know, a PhD to know what's going on here. It would be, I think, the best gift you could give to your community. So um, West Michigan's uh, business culture uh, is, is one that favors doing the right thing over regulation. And I wholeheartedly support that approach that businesses can um, and should be responsible for the products that they're putting out into the world. Um, but I don't think that we are going to change these issues um, for future generations if we depend on business alone. And, um, and you as consumers, 
uh, should be able to trust that um, businesses are operating in a regulatory space that favors your health, your well-being, and um, and in your future. And um, I mentioned the precautionary rules earlier. It is my hope that um, that in the next decade we will um, start to integrate precautionary practices into. Um, our regulatory work, uh, because not every business is going to be a good actor. I mean, I think about like Juul um, and uh, and the vaping issue that we have right now. Um, people have obviously been, you know, just kind of blindly trusting this business, um, and and they haven't been through a regulatory process. And in our political climate the word regulation has become very, very toxic in and of itself, pardon the pun, right? <laughs> um, so I, I think this is um, a space uh, um, as where your generation, but also um, mine and, and, and Winnie's and Rick's, we are all responsible for changing the way that we make our world um, through better design uh, through you know smarter science, and then through good regulation that um, that honors people and our environment. Would you mind talking a little bit about how young people can get involved? What are some great resources for this? I know you mentioned a couple of websites that I don't think everybody quite got, but if we could get that one more time. Um, and then I want to open it up to some audience questions. I know we've done a good job of kind of mixing that in, but I can see some people are looking curious, so I want to get to them too. Um, I would say League of Conservation Voters, LCV. Uh, it's a national organization with state uh, level organizations. It's been really active in Michigan and they're pretty well informed on this issue. Uh, Sierra Club has local chapters, uh, easy to get involved with them. Um, WEMIAC locally, uh, certainly where Rachel used to be the executive director, uh, that's West Michigan Environmental Action Council, and they have uh, various sister organizations throughout the state. So if you end up you know, moving back home or you came from somewhere else or you moved some to some other beautiful part of our state, uh, you'll find uh, similar chapters uh, in those. There's also, uh, if you're uh, into the outdoors, there's various recreation uh, organizations that weigh in on this kind of thing once in a while. The conservation groups, um, Ducks Unlimited, uh, I don't know about all the unlimiteds, but there's a bunch of unlimiteds, whatever it is that you're hunting and fishing for. <laughs> Pheasants forever. Um, Trout Unlimited is a, a big one, and they've been really um, uh, pretty uh, good about educating their membership uh, about um, the whole fishing impacts on fisheries. Um, what other organizations? The, the Citizens Advisory uh, um, Board. Yeah. Well, if you if you actually have a very specific um, contamination spot, there may be a citizens advisory board that you could go uh, be informed by. Um, but uh, many of those uh, earlier organizations, especially, uh, have a political action arm, so they do some advocacy. So that allows you to get some emails or something that will give you ideas of what you can make a difference on in terms of advocating for or against specific policies or bills. Uh, so that can be really concrete, which can be more rewarding than just uh, getting yourself informed, but um, both important, of course. What else can be done? Oh yeah, elect people who care about this and who are willing to talk to you about this and who recognize that our actions have an impact uh, for generations to come and that we have a responsibility uh, to ensure that we are um, not only considering health and well-being of our, our human citizens, but the entire environment uh, and water and the entire system that it all uh, works together. Um. Uh, quick one. Uh, finding a legislator who's working on these issues or a county commissioner serving as an intern for that individual to help them move forward on these issues, hint, hint. <laughs> um, one of the uh, most established uh, stakeholder-driven process, uh, processes is uh, organized in the state of Michigan around watersheds. And there's the Lower Grand River Association of Watersheds. They meet once a month. 
uh, Lake Makatawa watershed meet once once a month. Uh, Muskegon, I, I'm very involved with the Muskegon area of concern. Uh, we meet once a, once a month, but uh, start going to some of these uh, stakeholder uh, groups that are actively involved with uh, environmental uh, restoration and and protection. And the nice thing about going to those meetings is you'll see state legislators. <laughs> come to those meetings, uh, Corps of Engineers come to the meetings, uh, business leaders come to the meetings, and one of the hardest things as a student is, you know, how do I network? How do I get people to recognize who I am? Um, start going to the meetings, uh, ask questions, show interest in some of the volunteer projects, and um, I uh, much preferred to work in a laboratory <laughs> you know, early in my career. I did not want to get involved with public service, but um, I've come to see that as a real critical part of what I do, and the only way you get better at something is practice and uh, go to those meetings and uh, see what concerned citizens uh, are doing, see what uh, environmental initiatives are out there, and these initiatives are not just, you know, clean water. I mean, the city of the Plainfield Township has just went through a, a fluorine-free <laughs> initiative where the products that they buy are, are not fluorine con containing. So they're working on a whole bunch of different types of uh, uh, very important programs. So uh, get involved with your local watershed and uh, make waves. <laughs> I would just like to say, assuming some of you are students in the sciences, um, Pelan and I have had this conversation a few times, and I think maybe even you and I did a while ago, but um, I think a lot of people go into the sciences and they think that, um, you know, if they just focus on the data and focus on, um, and, you know, really the true science pieces uh, um, of learning that, um, that that's good. And, you know, we honor scientists, we appreciate those skill sets, but I would also encourage you to challenge yourself to um, learn how to articulate issues, um, to you know, maybe take a, a debate course or a, a communications course that helps to enrich your ability to um, break the wall. Uh, you know, I've really experienced in my career a, a, the communications wall between um, technical people and non-technical policy people. And sometimes we can spend years just circling around each other, trying to talk to each other, but failing to really communicate. Um, I can't tell you how many times as a policy person I've been shut down by a technical person because I didn't use the exact right terms. And that includes my husband, <laughs> who is a scientist. That's a really unfair practice. And that's a practice that leads to crises like these. Um, so becoming a scientist, to me, in this day and age, it, it also requires us to be communicators. And we talked a lot about, uh, you know, being informed about your the products that you purchase. I th also think it's important to ask retailers um, what's in the stuff they're selling. Like, um, I went and bought a, a pan the, the other day, and I asked, is there PFAS in this pan? Because they're in nonstick pans. Um, and immediately the sales clerk knew what I was talking about. Uh, she pointed me to, uh, you know, the information on the box about uh, what was was or was not in the pan. Um, and so that doesn't happen without their sort of corporation or their, their it was over at Sur La Table over uh, uh, close to my house. Uh, you can spend a lot of money there. Um, <laughs> But they they knew about it because they were trained on it, and they were trained on it because customers are asking, and they need to have an answer or their business won't survive. Home Depot is the same, right? They're getting questions about their carpet. Uh, it's really important when you have a little baby and they're crawling around on that d uh, carpet and they're, you know, picking up those fibers and they're ingesting whatever chemicals are on there to understand what you're exposing your children to. People care a lot about that. And when you ask your retailers that, it makes them have to answer. And it makes them learn and then uh, hopefully make choices that can impact um, uh, the entire stream of products that there is even a market for. Do we have any questions from the audience? I guess this one is aimed more at the, at the toxicologist. 
So I, I know that the, the toxicology is still quite murky, right? I mean, there are a lot of things we don't know. Can you give the audience some idea of, of the scale of the problem, at least for the most severely exposed folks, you know, the, the thousand people who've been living with contaminated wells for 20 years? So you know, are, are there, how, how, how bad might the cancer cluster problem be? How bad might the fertility problem be? Are there, you know, do we expect nobody who grew up there for the past 20 years to be able to get pregnant? Or do we think the fertility rates might be decreased by a tenth of a percent? Can you give us an idea of what the, the scale of the impact on an individual is so that people know, in some sense, know how concerned they should personally be, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, effects on that? Well, I uh, don't have the, uh, the crystal ball, but I, I can uh, tell you for a fact that uh, I know from, from talking to people, um, people that have been exposed, uh, their children, the vaccines aren't taking. Aren't taking. Um, they had to have, uh, they, they, they followed up after they had their five, uh, their, their five immunity uh, vaccines, they, they followed up with their child and he was deficient in, in three out of the five as far as antibodies. So um, I don't know how frequent that is, but I, I know there is a person that has drank the water that her child is, has been affected in that way. Um, also the same with um, fertility. Um, pe people have with, with high uh, water concentrations, um, there's been issues with uh, fertility, miscarriages, um, cholesterol. So um, I think if you're in the high level exposure group, <coughs> I would certainly be more concerned than if I was in the, you know, 10 parts per trillion range. But uh, the, the tough part about PFAS in your drinking water is that uh, you accumulate it a hundred fold. I mean, it, it just doesn't, you know, if you're drinking 10 parts per trillion, you don't get 10 parts per trillion. Your body hangs on to that, your kidneys reabsorb it, and uh, that 10 parts per trillion, you know, jumps up 100 times. So, um, the, and with, with PFAS, it's much more of an issue with sensitive groups, and uh, that, that's uh, women uh, and, and fetuses and, and uh, young children. So young children drink more water. So um, I don't, really know how many more cases of cancer we're going to get, uh, but I do know that people that have uh, drank the water with, with high levels definitely have health-related issues for that. So, and I think the fact that it does accumulate in our bodies and we don't excrete it, um, it, it's just more reason to be judicious in terms of our product, buying products, and I hope we're, we reach a, in the next couple years where uh, you cannot buy a water bottle that contains BPA. I mean, everybody, you know, stays away from BPA bottles and things like that. That we have the same issue with the fluorinated materials. That where we have something that uh, gives us a, a direct route uh, for consumption, that we don't have these compounds in them. So. So as we start to talk about um, the health components of of this issue. Um, it's important to address that uh, MPART has been working to um, educate or mobilizing to educate health providers, so nurses, docs, um, how do you handle an individual who presents you with, um, with you know, this high level of exposure? What do you need to be looking for? Um, you know, what, what treatments uh, are, are going to be important? And then, um, in other cases uh, uh, of significant contaminant exposures, uh, registries have been created which allow individuals uh, who are experiencing health effects that are likely linked to um, a toxic exposure. Uh, they're able to identify themselves and, um, and start to share information so that scientists and health providers can work together on um, better understanding uh, you know, where these issues are emerging, uh, what kinds of health impacts there, uh, there may be, and then again, you know, how best to respond. Uh, 
there, and it's a really important role of government. We did get some federal dollars uh, now to actually establish a health study. Uh, and there, I think there's two locations in Michigan that have been selected to have those folks participate so that we can gain in that knowledge. And eventually, I think, George, we will have some um, some specific numbers around some conditions, the, certainly the ones that were anecdotes that lead us to believe that this doesn't get better, right? Like for a long time, the industry kind of said, well, you know, you can't prove that it's harmful. And they're right. Uh, but every time we learn a little bit more, it gets worse, right? It's clear which direction this is going. Um, now, how bad and uh, at what point um, we realize which exposures are really the levels that we have to be concerned about over time um, is, is the question. And eventually, I think we will be able to quantify it. But I think uh, even knowing what we know now with partial information, we know we need a lot less of it uh, ingested in order for us all to be healthy. Um, and another thing that makes it really difficult is somebody may have lived in Rockford their entire lives um, and they're four years old and they drink a lot of water. Um, you know, they may have lived there for four decades um, uh, or they may have just moved there. And so it's really hard to, to determine those exposures. They may have come from some place, you know, next to a DuPont plant where they were really highly exposed and we don't know all of those factors yet so it's hard to figure out exactly but you do see trends I know you know there are folks who've who've come to us and said you know there were just a really high number of incidences of childhood cancers on our street in Rockford and now looking back all these kids have moved away in different places um, and and some are have uh, are deceased right but they're they're trying to figure that stuff out so for us to be able to recreate that health data and get information that makes sense that helps us learn what happens um, not just to this generation but to the next generation of people who were exposed we need to have that l that long-term study and we need to have uh, like a government entity that can follow people and ask them the right questions and monitor their blood levels over decades really in order for us to really know the answer to that question. But um, in, in my mind, there's no question we need those answers. Uh, but in the meantime, more protection is better. Um, so uh, we have a, a long-term health uh, study for PBB, which was um, a chemical exposure in the 70s. Was it the 70s um, up north in, in the farming community mostly? But it got into milk and meat and all kinds of stuff. And so there were tons of people exposed. The state has maintained a health registry for that. I believe there's a health registry for flint exposures with um, lead. So we have some experience with that. And we can learn incredibly valuable information from that. So. Um, I, I think that we'll have some answers to those questions when you and I are, are so old and gray that we may not care anymore. All right. Uh, we're almost done. I see Kate has got our final question. I'm wondering about the workers at Wolverine, at LAX, at all the places that have shown contamination. Firefighters. Besides firefighters, uh, military personnel. What about them? Uh, they've just started to do a firefighter, uh, a pretty in-depth study of firefighters because uh, it's not only handling the foam, but uh, all of their gear that they wear is, is full of the fluorinated compounds. And I think there's going to be more information coming out. Um, but the, the uh, exposure workers, uh, we're looking at firefighters as, as one of the main exposures right now we're going to be looking at that in detail so there is a movie that was made um, and it follows workers uh, I believe at the DuPont plant um, the devil we know and it talks about uh, and so those are probably some of the highest exposures but that's I think when we first started we corporately first started asking those hard questions and um, uh, the industry started you know, this misinformation campaign about how safe it is. So uh, that's that's kind of the beginning. But it's a it's a sobering, sobering watch. I think you can watch it on Netflix. Um, again, one of the reasons why I'm pretty passionate about this is that uh, the, uh, you know, I've, I've seen that movie, but we have people in Rockford that just drank water that have higher blood levels than the people that worked at in DuPont and at 3M, and we have a young child that's got higher levels in his body uh, just from, from uh, mother's milk and uh, drinking water. Uh, 
uh, two years of exposure has she, that, that child has higher blood levels than the than, uh, DuPont workers. So uh, we have some very significant exposures right in our local community. Yes. So this touches on worker safety, um, OSHA practices, et cetera, updating those. Uh, if you know, if you're interested in human resources at all, this is you know work that needs to be done in manufacturing uh, 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 plants ac across the country and in uh, cities that municipalities that hire firefighters, et cetera. Um, I I did one thing I. I'm not sure if you touched on it before I got here, but um, one thing that's been missing in the last hour of discussion is the role of journalists. Um, so I wanted to just touch on that really briefly before we close up and um, and thank uh, people like Garrett Ellison, who um, without him, I don't know that this story uh, would have continued to have so much momentum um, and, and, and so many uh, uh, positive outcomes in the midst of a very difficult situation. Uh, without journalists, uh, elected leaders in the city of Rockford and in Kent County and in Plainfield Township and Belmont could have continued to just bury this issue. Uh, so, so journalists play a, a critical role and, um, and everything from citizen journalism, you know, up to working for the New York Times. Um, it's all very relevant. Absolutely. Um, I am going to ask all of you to join me in thanking our distinguished guests for being here with us tonight. I just want, I'd like to just close with a couple of thoughts. Um, first of all, I want to recognize uh, the value of your time, um, Senator Brinks and Representative Hood, Dr. Rudisky. Um, thank you very much for choosing to spend your time um, with us here at Grand Valley. Uh, I really appreciate the, um, the nuance of our discussion tonight. I, I can certainly say that I learned a lot about both the science as well as the impact and potential um, policy that uh, you know um, has the potential to to make a, uh, a change or make changes that we'd like to see. Um, I really also appreciated the various references to the um, disciplines that our students are studying in. So, you know, I appreciate the reference to the fact that there's a role for scientists and there's a role for business people and there's a role for journalists. So there are ways for all of us in our disciplines to to play a positive role in our communities and around this particular issue. Um, thank you also for being so specific with some of your, um, your guidance for us around the things that we on our campus and in our community here at Grand Valley can do. Um, I wanted to add to some of the suggestions that, um, that our panelists have made. Here uh, on campus, there are a number of student organizations that you are, um, you know, have access to and can certainly join with. There's a student environmental coalition. Um, there's a soil and land conser uh, conservation group. Um, so there's power in um, organizing, whether that's aligning yourselves with a group, uh, you know, in a municipal uh, location off, uh, off campus or working together with students here on campus um, as well. Uh, if you are interested and you're not yet registered to vote, um, I want to just let all of you know that that's something that we can help you with. Um, tonight, Jane Johnston, who um, is in the back, is able to help any of you who are interested register to vote. Um, we also have National Voter Registration Day coming up next week. We're actually going to celebrate it twice because we think it's that important. Um, so we'll be downtown with the Michigan Mobile Secretary of State Unit on Monday the 23rd at the DeVos campus. And then we're going to really uh, throw a party on Tuesday at the Clock Tower. Um, we will have Louis the Laker and popcorn and yard games, um, a DJ. I think the marching band might be coming out. Um, so if you're not registered to vote, please do uh, come and do so. Um, as you know, we heard our panelists talk about uh, the really the most fundamental way for us to exercise um, our voices is to make sure that we're able to vote, um, among other means. Um, and if you are registered, then bring a friend um, or bring a friend anyway. 
Um, so come on out and in, uh, join us then. Um, also, just a quick plug, uh, some really great topics are coming up um, in our series, Democracy 101, youth political engagement. So we talk about what we can do. Um, there's a panel on uh, the student senate um, and student media. So there are lots of really great opportunities for you to think about uh, the ways that you can get involved and really um, organize yourselves with others to make it an impact on the issues that you care about. Um, so. Other than that, um, I want to thank our co-sponsors for the evening, the Making Waves Initiative. I really want to say thank you again to all of our panelists. We really appreciate you being here. And thanks to all of you for showing up. We hope you come back. Um, you do have eval evaluations on your seat, so please do make sure you fill those out before you go. And I hope everyone has a very lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you.